Well, today we're continuing in this series that we've been in now for several weeks called Jesus, the Call to Follow. And I always like to take just a minute or two at the top, and, and just for those of you who are brand new, give you, kind of bring you up to speed, uh, th- this is a series um, that's it's really the second of the three-part series that's on the, the life of Jesus, as told through the eyes, uh, the, the story of Jesus, as told through the eyes of one of the leaders of the early movement of Jesus. His name was uh, Mark. He wrote a gospel called The Gospel of Mark. Mark was a close personal friend and interpreter of the apostle Peter. So what we have in the Gospel of Mark is a story of the life and teaching of Jesus through the firsthand experiences uh, of the Apostle Peter. And so today we come to uh, a section in the Gospel in chapter 9 where Mark is choosing to insert some teaching from Jesus on how to follow him. Uh, and this is really kind of unusual because in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark isn't real big on teaching. He, he's real big on action. And so unlike, say, Matthew or Luke that have these long passages where teaching of Jesus is laid out, uh, Mark doesn't do that very often. This is one of the exceptions to the rule. And today what it seems he's doing is he's taking uh, this kind of, uh, kind of a wide assortment, kind of a, a random collection of teaching of Jesus on what it means to follow, and he's kind of piecing it all together, but he's doing it in a particular way where it's uh, kind of each topic that he inserts kind of leads to the next topic sort of naturally. Uh, by, and it, they're connected by a series of catch words or phrases or concepts, almost like, think of it like a cascading waterfall, where kind of each, each teaching kind of needs, leads naturally to the next one, leads naturally to the next one as it goes down, and, and often connected by these series of catch words. And so, uh, if you have your Bibles, what I'd like you to do is open with me to Mark chapter 9. If you've got your apps, go ahead and turn those on. And there in your note sheet, there's a section called The Call to Follow, Cascading Concepts. And so what you'll see there is I've, I've listed a series of bullets, and each bullet represents a separate topic. And so we're just going to walk through these together, and then we're going to come back at the end, and, uh, and, and we're going to highlight a couple key principles that kind of uh, undergird all the teaching of Jesus that are really critical for understanding the teaching of Jesus in big picture. And then we're going to come back at the end and ask a couple of very practical questions for our own life of how this fits. And so... Uh, if you've got your Bibles there, we're going to pick it up at Mark chapter 9 and verse 38. And you see the first topic, and, and like I said, they're kind of a series of random topics. The first topic is, I'm calling unauthorized exorcisms. And so here we go. So in verse 38, uh, John comes up to Jesus, and they've been off in town, apparently, his disciples. John remembers one of the inner three, uh, Peter, James, and John, one, one of the guys up on the transfiguration with him. And he's going to be one of the futures of the movement. He comes up to Jesus. He says, teacher, rabbi, he said, "Um, we saw a man and he was driving out demons in your name. And uh, we told him to knock it off because he wasn't one of us. (laughs) It's great. It's like he's not part of our church. He should not be doing this. Uh, I, I don't know who thought, you know, who made him king, you know, but they're driving out demons, which we all agree that's a good thing. Like they're freaking them, but John's coming back. I don't know, he, he didn't have the right Jesus card, you know, no authorization. And so, so let's stop here, let's go back and kind of set this up a little bit. Remember last week that Jesus said the path to greatness always leads to the door of what? service, right? And so, so Jesus said, hey, listen, I know you guys are trying to be top dog and, and trying to be great in my kingdom, but he said, honestly, the way that we measure where I come from is very different. And so we, we measure a person's greatness by how much they love others, how much they love God, love others. And he said, and the way you measure this is by service, service natural all flows. So, so he said, so, so don't try to be like the greatest in terms of prominence, just love others well. And then remember to illustrate that, he, he, he brings this little child. And remember we talked about in their, in their culture that children were like the low point of the totem pole. And so this little child, this little one, kind of represents those in culture that are the least of these. Remember how Jesus wraps his arm and he says, hey, when you love one of the least of these, these little ones, in my name, it's like you're, you're welcoming me, you're really honoring me. And so you need to look at greatness, kind of not like prominence, not like a position, not like power, not like popularity, but you need to look at it in terms of through the eyes of service and love. And so right after that, then Mark follows up with this next event, which clearly shows the disciples don't have a clue. Because what, what's happening is they're out there, someone's casting out demons, and their concern is, hey, wait a second, that's our job. And so, so, uh, so we're going to see how Jesus responds to that. And so Jesus, uh, once again, says, verse 39, he says, do not stop him, because no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say something bad about us. 
And, and remember, right now, there's a lot of criticism of Jesus. That criticism is growing. And he says, hey, listen, this is not a bad thing. And he says, for whoever is not, a, who's not, uh, is not against us is for us. At this point in the game, anyone who's not trying to tear us down, he's actually kind of like on our team. And he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ, because you're a Christ follower, he will certainly not lose his reward. So he says, listen, this guy, he's not our enemy. Uh, he's sort of for us. He's helping us out. At this stage in the game, anyone not against us is for us. Anyone who loves you because you're my follower, uh, that's a good thing. God, God's going to reward them, all right? And so, so that's the first thing, unauthorized uh, exorcisms. Now, that leads to the next concept. And the next concept is, okay, well, these people are for us, but what about those people who are against us, all right? And so there on your note sheet, the next bullet is called internal stumbling blocks. And so what about those people that are not for us, those people who are against us, those people who really, if they had their way, would pull us away from following Jesus altogether? Jesus would call them stumbling blocks. And so uh, the next verse, he says, 42, and if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, and, and remember, little ones, we just defined that a couple verses ago. Little ones are not necessarily children, could be children, but it could be anyone who are the least of these in culture who are followers of Jesus, who believe, all right? So he says, anyone who causes one of these little ones to sin. Now, interesting word here. The word to sin here is a word in Greek called skandalazo. And it's going to become a very important word in the New Testament because what it really means is not just sin like do something bad one time. It's talking about stumble. It's talking about fall away. So he's saying anyone who causes one of these uh, vulnerable believers to stumble, to fall away from their faith in Jesus. That, that's the idea. And this will be the key word that kind of ties this next section together. So he says, anyone who causes anyone to sin or to stumble, fall away, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Now, in those days, uh, they would have these, the way you would crush gr a grain off, it is you'd have these huge millstones. I mean, they're, they're massive, you know, massive millstones, hole in the middle of them, you'd, you'd put a uh, kind of a, uh, I don't know, a long beam through them, and then the oxen would, would go in a circle, and these, these things would roll and crush out the grain. And so Jesus is saying, very graphic, he says, imagine one of those put on someone's head like a, uh, like a necklace and then thrown into the ocean. And this is something the Romans actually did from time to time. This is one of the ways they would punish their enemies. They'd load them up with rocks and tie them on them and, and throw them into a lake and kill them. And so it's a very graphic thing. But Jesus is basically saying, hey, listen, anyone who, who causes, so I've told you about if someone does something good for you in the name of Jesus, they're going to get the reward. Well, on the flip side of that, anyone who causes a, a Christ follower to stop following, they're going to have the severest of pental, penalties, right? So that's uh, internal or external stumbling blocks. Now, next one is internal stumbling blocks. So it leads to this idea of scandalazo, uh, this key word that causes us to stumble. People from the outside, it leads to the next topic. Well, what about things on the inside that cause us to stumble? Uh, it might be a temptation. It might be a wrong priority. It might be uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, that causes us to fall away from Christ. And so, so he says in verse 42 or 43, and if your hand causes you to sin, and, and guess what the word is for sin? Scandalazo, right? So there's the catch word. You see this cascading phrase. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, like there's nothing, you're something you're pursuing in your life, Right? That is causing you to fall away from Jesus. That's it, to, to Scott Delanza. He says, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Cut it off. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, he says, because it's better for you to enter into what? Life. Life. Let's say it together. It's better for you to enter into what? Life. life. And so Jesus is talking now about the next life. Later on, he's going, to, he's going to define next life as the kingdom of God. Okay, so there's, there's synonyms. But he's saying it's better for you to go into the next life um, maimed than with two hands to go into what? Hell. So he's contrasting the next life uh, uh, with hell. And he says where the, where the fire never goes out. All right? And that, now he says, now in case you missed that, you were falling asleep at that point in the sermon 
uh, let me repeat that. And if your foot causes you to scandalazo, okay, your, your foot causes you, in other words, you're on a, your, your feet are leading you in a path of life that's going to lead you away from Jesus. Your feet are causing you to scandalazo. He says, then, um, he says, then go ahead and cut it off because it's better for you to enter into life and, and be crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into what? Hell, Hell okay? Uh, we just don't like saying that word, so I'm going to make us say it. Okay, uh, 47. And so, and if your eye causes you to sin, so there's something that's captured your affections and, and you're, you're, you're kind of, kind of it's longing for that and you're, it's just, it's, it's, you're kind of coveting that. So I think of 1 John chapter 2, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride, something that's drawing us in that's going to pull us away from Jesus. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Get out the spoon. Here we go. Because uh, it's better for you to enter into what? The kingdom of God. So notice how the life and the kingdom of God are synonyms here. He's talking about the next life. They're synonyms. And he says, it's because it's better to go for, to enter into life, the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into what? Yeah. Hell, okay. And so now, so this topic of hell now comes up. And so it leads to the next little, uh, kind of next topic, which is the danger of hell. And in the last book of, the, of Isaiah, which is famous prophet in the Old Testament, the last chapter, uh, there is a scene where the, the kingdom of God comes, all right? And the kingdom of God is described in Isaiah 66 as the new heavens and the new what? Earth. Earth, All right? So it's not ethereal. It's not off on la-la land. It's not floating in clouds. The kingdom of God is about new heavens and new earth, tangible, physical. This cosmos restored. All right? So in Isaiah, the way it ends up, it says when when God returns and and returns all wrongs to right, and there's new heavens and new earth, it says there are some who will resist there are some who will rebel against his leadership. There are some who refuse to be made right, to be made whole, to be fixed. And he says, those people will be destroyed. And he says, the end result of that, and this is the verse he's quoting here, okay? The, in the last verse 66 of Isaiah 66, is verse 48. He says, th- this is how Isaiah ends, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Okay, so he's describing hell here. Now, this talk about fire then, the fire of hell, leads cascades to the next topic, which is salted by fire. And so the, the Jesus says, everyone will be salted by fire. Now, we're not sure exactly what Jesus is talking about here. What we believe he's talking about is the fire of persecution. In the Old Testament, God required when you brought your sacrifices to him that you always brought them with a pinch of salt, the salt represented purification because in the ancient world, uh, you didn't have refrigerators. The way you kept meat from going bad is you salted it. So salt was a picture of purity, of preservation. And so Jesus says, you know, as your lives, as followers of mine, they're like living sacrifices. And as you present them before me, they're going to be salted by fire. They're going to be salted by persecution, which is where this series started off this first week. If you, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to be ready for, to die for Jesus. And then it leads, this, this talk about salt leads to the next cascading concept, which is the salt of the earth. And this one would be more familiar. Remember back in, 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 the, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, as my disciples, and you are the salt of the earth. So your, your job is to light it up, show the path to life. Here's, here's how life is to be lived. And your job is to preserve the world from, going rot, from rotting. And so as you pursue what is right and good and true, that will slow down the rot in culture, uh, in, in society. And so, so he goes on, he says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, in other words, you're not living out, you're not following me, how can it be made salty again? Okay, and then this talk about salt now, he's going to, he's the last concept, he's going to talk about being at peace with one another. Remember how this passage started. It starts with uh, Jesus and his disciples, they're arguing who will be the greatest. So there's conflict. Then he follows up this long teaching of cascading concepts, and it ends up with this last verse where it says, have salt in yourselves, but be at peace with each other. 
So, so don't be arguing who's the greatest. And so what Mark seems to be doing is just kind of taking a, a, a moment. He wants to insert some random teaching of Jesus on a bunch of topics. So what it looks like to follow Jesus, he inserts it here in this section, this series where we're talking about the call to follow. He just kind of inserts it, but he does it in a very artistic way to where it's, uh, if you're memorizing or whatever, these phrases, you know, scandalazzo, uh, fire, salt. There's kind of one strip, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of causing your mind to be able to remember the next. So it's kind of a mnemonic device. To, to help people in a world where most people weren't literary, didn't actually read, that they'd, they'd be able to memorize. It just kind of helps, all right? So, so that's the passage. Now, here's what I want to do today. In the time that we have, I want to highlight a couple principles that Jesus talks about here that are really foundational for understanding Jesus and all of his teaching. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called future focus, the radical realities. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump in. We're going to take longer on the first one, a little shorter on the second one, and then come back and ask a couple penetrating questions that flow out of this teaching. And so here we go. The, the first thing that I think Jesus wants us to understand in this passage, is just really critical for understanding Jesus and so on, we've talked about it before, is that the future is real. Okay, for, for Jesus, the future is real. And so we talked about this in this series. You remember these three key, uh, key uh, words that I've come back to over and over in this series. So if you can understand Jesus, if you can understand the teaching of Jesus, if you can understand who we're called to be, three key words. The words were countercultural, radical, future focused, right? All three of those words are going to come to play today. We're going to see all three of those words in the teaching of Jesus. But right here, the word that jumps out the most is this teaching of Jesus about the next life. It's his future focus. And, and what Jesus does, he talks about it in terms on the positive side, he calls it life. Like we think of this life as life. Jesus does it. This life is like death. He says what's coming next is reality life. Uh, you know, like C.S. Lewis used to say, this life is the shadow lands. It's the next life It's real. And so, for Jesus, the next life is life. That's why he calls it life. Uh, he, he says it's the kingdom of God, and then he contrasts it with hell. All right, so let's just look at a couple examples. I just want to drill this in before we, go, before we go on. In chapter 9, verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into what? Life, life okay? Uh, it's better life maimed with two hands to go into what? So he's contrasting upside and the downside of the next life. You go to verse uh, 47, and he says that if, you're, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to enter into the kingdom of God. There it is, the next life. With, with one eye, than have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Okay, so, so for Jesus, he's contrasting this. And one of the things that I've often told you, and as a church, I just want to bring us back to again and again, because it's so countercultural, is that it's impossible to understand Jesus or the teaching of Jesus without understanding the reality of the next life. Half the time, the teaching of Jesus does not even make sense without the reality of the next life. That Jesus always lives this life with the backdrop of the next life. He's like a high school student that's preparing for college. What you do now prepares for then. This life is all about the life, uh, the next life. And this is a great example of it. Um, now, this is hard for us for a couple reasons. One of the reasons is, as Christ followers living in this culture, we are absolutely the now culture, aren't we? we I mean, we are a culture that's all about the now, and we hear it 24-7. Uh, live for today. It's why we're in debt as a nation, and debt as we live for today. The concept of living for tomorrow we've lost, and it's destroying our nation, it's destroying our lives. And so, so for example, um, this week I was watching TV, and I can't remember what I was watching, but a commercial came on, and it was a commercial for uh, Pepsi Max, and it's, they're doing this new campaign right now, and, and the, whole, um, the whole slogan for this whole campaign, series of commercials, is live for now. 
And it's a very catchy, uh, very, very catchy promotion. Some great commercial. In this particular commercial, there's a, a young man and he's walking upstairs. He comes into this party and the party is just going on. You know, it's like a bunch of probably 20 something, great parties going on. And it's all this, you know, high driving music, it's exciting, and no one's paying attention because everyone's on their phone. Right? <laughs> I was texting, right? All this cool thing is happening, and they're unaware, for, they're unaware of what's happening because they're, not, they're just living on their phones. And so across the room, he spots this beautiful girl. Well, let me just show you. Okay, let's just go watch this. That awesome live for now you know he's like on their phones there's this beautiful girl and she's there and he goes up it's a little friend request be my friend you know it's just live for now and so so you, well, you watch it so I went online and I watched some of these commercials right and so brilliantly done and, and you know just get the point from that and so on but this is our culture it's like we're constantly being told live for now and here's what I want you to catch Jesus comes and he flies in the face of our culture and he says no you, know, you don't live for now you live for then. Okay. And so here's what I want you to catch. Every time you watch one of those commercials, I want you to remember Jesus, right? <laughs> I'm going to show that commercial, not just because it's fun, but because every time you see it, I want to remind you how countercultural Jesus is. He says, like, hey, if you want to live well, you, you have to live this life uh, for the next life. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. This is hard for us as modern-day Christ followers because, frankly, Often our view of the future is so pathetic and anemic. Like, like the thing is, is like if I were to ask you, and you don't raise your hands, I'm going to ask you, but if I were to ask you, what, when I say the word heaven, what comes to your mind? <laughs> yeah, you said it anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, clouds, right. So often our view of heaven has been more informed by our culture, movies, TVs, uh, TVs, yeah, movie, TV shows, uh, uh, it's, and, and also by misreading our Bibles. You see, for many of us, when we think of the next life, first of all, we think of heaven, which is out there somewhere, divorced from here, right? And often in our mind's eye, uh, we, kind of, we, we kind of see the, the, the camera shot gets real cloudy and hazy. People start floating around, whatever. And so we start, and then we start filling in images from the book of Revelation. Now, catch this, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation is what we call apocalyptic literature, right? It was a style of literature that was uh, well known in the ancient world, and, and like there's a great example in the book of Daniel where God gives Daniel this series of visions, right? And so in the book of Daniel, series of visions, and there's these monsters coming out of the sea, different kind of, different kind of animal monsters, right? And they're just very ferocious. And, and when the ancient world read that, they knew that, that Daniel wasn't predicting that someday in, in, the, in the future, these monsters were coming out of the They knew that. This was a symbol. It was a symbol of great kingdoms that would arise in the future. And everyone understood that. But the thing that happens to us as modern day Christians, we don't understand apocalyptic literature. We don't get that. And so we go to the book of Revelation. We start taking these images literally. Like, we, you know, like, like the lamb slain on the throne. Like there's not really going to be a lamb there with blood all over on the throne. That's an image to describe the reality of our Savior who was crucified, right? Well, when you see uh, streets of gold, they're not really streets of gold. That's an image. It's telling you that what is the most valuable thing on earth, we will walk on there. It's an image. You see, it's, it's a descriptor. It's to help us say that, to help us kind of, kind of picture the future. And so what happens for us as modern day Christ followers, we have these images in our mind. So when we think of the next life, we start thinking in terms of ethereal. We think of clouds. We think of, like I like to say, uh, chubby little angels with aerodynamically challenged wings. (laughs) 
We think of eternal worship services. <laughs> now, now I, I am a passionate about worship. I love worship. But after about two hours, I'm done. <laughs> I, I need a break. Turn on a football game, go for a walk, go to dinner, read a book, do something. But, and, and so, but these are the images we have, and they're not very compelling. Here's what I want you to catch. For Jesus and his disciples, they had very different images of the next life. They were shaped by the Old Testament. And the Old Testament describes the next life like this, new heavens and new earth. Peter picks up that language in 2 Peter. You'll check this out in your life group homework this week. He, he picks it up and he quotes that. It's a new heavens and a new what? earth. It's, it's physical. It's tangible. It's amazing. Isaiah 25 talks about that when the kingdom of God comes, that it'd be like this banquet with the richest of foods and the choicest of wines. Now, I can get into that, <laughs> right? Go to the two-hour worship service. Let's go have some great food and great wine. I'm all in, okay? Now, I'm beginning to be compelled. And so, when the Old Testament describes it, it describes it that the next life, it's a place of healing. It's a place where the lame walk. It's a place where the blind see. This is why the teaching of or the miracles of Jesus were a foretaste to the coming of the kingdom. And they're, they're powerful. So, so for the disciples and for Jesus, the next life is where all wrongs is turned to right. And, and scholars will argue and debate whether, whether it means that this cosmos, like our planet, will be destroyed and remade or whether it will be actually destroyed in a brand new. But it's not just a new heaven off somewhere. It's a new heaven and a new what? Earth. And we will rule. And it will be amazing. And so as Christ's followers, what Jesus is saying is, listen, you've got to get clear on this. That whatever happens this life is simply the lobby into eternity. And so you need to live this life for that life if you're going to live this life well. Now, of course, in this passage, the emphasis is not just on the new heavens and the new earth. The emphasis is on hell, right? The opposite. And so three times, just to make sure we don't miss it, Jesus talks about hell. Whatever it takes, don't, don't go there. Now, it's interesting. The word he uses for hell is a word that's called, uh, in Greek, it's called Gehenna. Gehenna is a Greek translation of the Hebrew, which means the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was right outside Jerusalem. And in ancient times, when the kings of Israel were, were not following God, they would actually worship idols right outside Jerusalem there in the Valley of Hinnom. And then they would actually sacrifice children to pagan gods. They, they would take their babies, and they, they would heat up statues of Molech, uh, and they would they'd take their little babies and put them on these burning hot set and fry these children alive. And so later on, because of the, how horrible that was, Israel shut down the Valley of Hittim, and they turned it into a dump. And so what happens, all the trash, all the human waste, the human refuse, uh, criminals, uh, are thrown in the Valley of Hinnom, and there's fires there, the type of Jesus, fires burning in the dump to consume this. And so the fire's burning, worms are, are eating, call it that, and it becomes a picture of hell. And so the question is, uh, the question is, in, uh, well, so is that literal? Is, is hell literal, or is it more symbolic? And, and I would say, well, I, my, my hunch is, I think most would probably say that, that when it's talking about hell, it's symbolic, just like these pictures of heaven are symbolic. But I want you to catch this. When I say symbolic, I don't mean not real. Yeah. Like Jesus is not saying, it's like the fires of hell. You know, it's not real. It's like a bunch of guys drinking beers together, cracking jokes. No. Yeah? It's not like, it's like, no, this is horrible. This is awful. Picture how, picture this. Picture outer darkness. Picture uh, uh, just being left out, being, being, being picture, uh, being burned alive. Picture these kinds of things. It's horrible, right? And so, so what Jesus said is the future is real. It's amazing or it's awful. And you need to do whatever you, you, you can to make sure you make the right choice. Just a couple of quotes on both sides of it. There on your note sheet, a quote on the positive side. Now, I love this quote. This is from uh, John Eldridge who wrote the book Wild at Heart, but he wrote a book later on called The Journey of Desire. He talks about heaven, and see if you can relate to this. He says, I think the fear of being bored is an unspoken fear of many people about the life that's, that's coming. 
After all, the never-ending sing-along in the sky isn't exactly breathtaking. (laughs) Spending a weekend at the beach beats that hands down. Our lives in the coming kingdom will be surrounded with great beauty and our hearts filled with love, but what will we do with ourselves forever and ever? I have yet to meet a Christian who has the faintest notion of what his life will be will entail beyond the eternal church service. I guess it will be good, sighed one friend, but guesses are not enough. We must know. So there's one side of it, right? The other side of it, quote from C.S. Lewis, and he talks about the reality of hell. Here's the interesting thing, is that in our culture today, and even as Christ follows, uh, sometimes in the church of Jesus, that we don't like the idea of hell. Here's a really interesting thing, is guess where we got our concept of the next life and that God is love. Guess where we got that from? We got it from Jesus. That is a unique teaching. There is no other world religion that says God is love. We get that from Jesus. But we also get from Jesus that hell is real. And what's interesting in our culture, what we've done is we've taken the one side of the teaching of Jesus and embraced that as a culture. We've rejected the other side. But if you trust Jesus, you got to listen to him on both sides. And and C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says this concept of final judgment, this concept of final separation, our heavens and earth and and hell, uh, the, 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 the wheat and the tear, it just runs through all the teaching of Jesus. It's impossible to make sense of the teaching of Jesus apart from this. In fact, he's got a great quote there. He says, the day of judgment is an idea very familiar and very dreadful to Christians. Like, no one gets happy about this. But if there's any concept which cannot by any conjuring be removed from the teaching of our Lord, it's that of the great separation. And now he begins to give examples of the teaching of Jesus where he taught Jesus over and over again. The sheep and the goats, the broad way and the narrow way, the wheat and the tares, the winnowing fan, the wise and foolish virgins, the good fish and the refuse, the door closed on the marriage feasts with some inside and some outside in the dark. And he says, from his, his own words, the picture of doomsday has come into Christianity. Okay, so, so Jesus is clear. This future is real. The stakes are high. So live this life for the next life, all right? Amen. Now, number two. The second thing that flows out of this passage is that there's at times we have to get radical to be ready. This next life is coming. It's real. And there's times that we have to get radical uh, to to be ready. And so we, when we talk about three key words, countercultural, future-focused, radical. We've already talked about future-focused and how counterculture it is. Now we need to talk about this teaching of radical. This is a great example of the radical teaching of Jesus. I, I want you to picture this. You and your buddy, you've come from a little town maybe 30 miles away. You've heard of this new prophet named Jesus. You've heard his amazing teaching. You've heard that he can heal the sick and cast out demons. And so you just, you've heard the story so many times. Like, we've got to see this guy. So you get your buddy. Let's call him John. All right. Get your buddy. Hey, John, we got to go, man. Let's just take a couple days off work. Let's just travel down there. Let's just hang out. Let's just check him out. This is amazing. This may never happen again. And so you travel 30 miles, right? So you're, you're down there and you're just like, you cannot wait. This is going to be awesome. And he heals a couple people and you're like, blow it away. And now he's starting to teach us, like, this is going to be great. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts talking about the next life. And he's like, all right, so, hey, if your right hand, has ever caused you to kind of fall away from God and do something you shouldn't do and, and, and it's causing you to, to kind of leave the right path, what I want you to do is to pull out a knife and cut it off. <laughs> you know, John's kind of falling asleep. You're like, hey, buddy, wake up. You got to hear this. <laughs> What's going on? It's like, God, I'm just talking about cutting off things. I don't know. It's just <laughs> weird. What? Yeah, no kidding. Seriously? Yeah, let's see what he says next. And so if you ever, your feet get you into trouble, you're heading down the wrong path in life, get that hacksaw, cut that sucker off. <laughs> Woo! Like, it's like, this guy's crazy. Yeah, what's he going to say next? Hey, if your eyes have ever got you in trouble, why don't you pull out a spoon, 
Pluck that sucker out. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the next life is real, hell's hot, don't want to go there. <laughs> See, we get way too comfortable with the teaching of Jesus. We, we've noted this all through this series. Remember back in chapter 8? If anyone would follow me, take up your cross. And we talked about the images that would come to their mind. 6,000 men crucified at one time over 120 miles in the Appian Way. We talked about last week where Jesus said, hey, if you want to be truly great in life, become a slave. What? Like, like Jesus, Jesus is kind of, a, kind of the, the shock jock of Christian radio, right? He, he, he is... He is like doing everything he can to wake us up and say, listen, life is serious. Don't screw it up. Like like how much more radical can you be than talking about cutting off body parts, right? And I I want you to go back in time and hear this for the first time. Jesus is doing everything he can to tell you the next life is real. Don't mess around. Don't let anything get in the way of following me. The stakes are too high. Okay? Now, leads to a couple couple questions. I bet you can't wait. Here we go. So the couple questions. The first one is really for those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus. You're, you're coming here. It may be your first time, maybe your 10th time. Uh, maybe you're coming with a friend, whatever. But uh, you, you're really kind of fascinated with Jesus. You're, you're uh, maybe been coming for a while. You like his teaching. It's been challenging. You find it's practical. It's working out in your life. You're kind of putting something into practice. And, and so, um, the, but you haven't yet made a decision to really give your life to Jesus and to really follow him and cross that line. The first question comes for you. So there in your note sheet is a section in the back called Future Focused, Ready or Not. And so the first question goes like this. Are you ready to follow follow Christ? Are you ready? As a non-believer today, are you ready to follow Christ? And and, and then I would would follow up with a, a secondary question you could write in. And the question is, if not, why not? Because here's what I found, that, that often when the Holy Spirit is working in a person's life and calling them to faith, there, there's often something that has to be cut off. There's something we have to leave behind. And it's often that thing that we don't want to leave behind that's keeping us from following. But Jesus says, whatever it is, trust me, it's worth it. See? Uh, at the start of this series, back in Mark chapter 1, which was uh, about 30 years ago, um, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you remember how the series started, but in chapter one, Jesus comes on the scene, northern part of, of Israel in the area called Galilee, and he, this, is, this is how Mark summarizes his message. There in your note sheet. It goes like this. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. And so for a thousand years, the prophets of Israel have been predicting that one day God's gonna break into human history and start fixing things called the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, that time is very near. And so he says, you need to do two things. You need to, first, what? Repent. And secondly, believe, believe the good news. These are two things. And so we talked about this. That when a person comes to Jesus, these are the two things we need to do. We need to repent, and we need to believe the good news. So, so what's the repentance about? Well, we talked about this. That in the Greek, the word for repent is this word that's meta noeo. So meta means against, noeo to think. So, metanoeo means to think against, or in other words, to change the way you think. And so, it's kind of like, I used to think this way, now I think this way. I used to be headed down this path in life, now I've done a U-turn, I'm going that way. It's changing direction. In context of Jesus and the kingdom, it means I used to run my own life, I've now come under Jesus' authority, he's my king, and now he runs my life. And so, Jesus says, if you're going to be part of my kingdom, this next life, at a core you have to repent, come under my leadership, and it's that repentance that often requires the cutting off of a hand, a foot, or an eye. That often there's something that has to go, and so what happens as a non-believer, 
we sense the Holy Spirit calling to us, and there's something within us that wants to get out of our seat and run to Jesus and trust him and believe him because there's something about his message and who he is we find so compelling. There's something about his offer, which is to completely forgive us and give us a new start in life. Uh, I like to call it total amnesty for all crimes against the kingdom. Uh, This promise he makes to fill us with his spirit, change us from the inside out, teach us how to live life the way it's meant to be lived, and then prepare us for the next life that's coming. This offer is so compelling, there's something within us that wants to jump out of our seat and run to Jesus and say, yes, will you forgive me? I want this new life. I want you in my life. Change my life. We want it. But often, there's something that holds us in our seat. It's a fear. It's a fear that if I follow Jesus, there's something I have to cut off. There's an arm, there's a, a foot, there's an eye. There's something that's precious to me that I'm going to have to let go. And here is what Jesus' word to you today. Hey, the stakes are too high. Don't let anything stop you from following me. Because I, I, do, I love you passionately, I've come to die for you. I've come to give you life, life to the full. You can trust me. So so repent and believe the good news. Believe that I've come to rescue you. Don't let anything get in the way. Take out that blade. Take out that hacksaw. Don't let anything stop you. Cut it off and come into life with me. I will heal you. I'll restore you. You'll find what life is about. And so if you're here today, and you haven't yet made that decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you that chance. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you that chance to to repent and to believe. Now, the second question is for those of us who are already Christ followers. We've gone through that process. There was a time in our life we repented, we believed, we entered into the kingdom. We asked Jesus, by based on his life, his death, his resurrection, to forgive us, to restore us. He began a work. He gave us his Holy Spirit. We, we were born again. Life became new. We began growing, all right? So the second question is for us, and it goes like this. Do you require any surgery? You know, often in life, we can be healthy for a long time, and then all of a sudden, something pops up, and we need to get that sucker out, right? <laughs> like, that, like, like the, something comes up, and, and like, you know, you think of the Civil War. I don't know if you've ever read much on the Civil War, but you know, if you've ever, it's very gruesome, because there's so many legs and arms are amputated, and, and the reason was gangrene. And what Jesus is saying in this, this cutting up, the, the thought is this, is that, is that, there are certain things in your life that if you don't cut them off, they will destroy you. It's like gangrene. It's like, yeah, it's hard to do, but you got, you got, it's like a cancer that's growing inside of you. And so sometimes we can be going through life and we're fine, and all of a sudden we feel a lump, right? And, and we go, it's like, this is cancer. This is going to, you got you to get it out. And this happens to us spiritually, too. That spiritually, there are times in our life, as you follow Jesus, where you come to certain crossroads well, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will do a, run a diagnostic test on your life. And he'll find something that says, hey, this needs to be de- dealt with. And if it's not, it's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. It may take you away from Jesus completely, or it may just slow you down. Right? But it needs to be dealt with. And so sometimes those things are flat out sin. Like sometimes as believers, we find ourselves where we, we fall into certain kinds of sin. And they're just, we know they're wrong and the Holy Spirit's screaming at us and we're ignoring him and we're just kind of pretending it's not that bad or we start making excuses or, or whatever. I remember the very first week I was working on this message. You know, I had a couple examples of this where where uh, I had a mom come to me and talk about her, uh, about her daughter who had grown up uh, claiming to be a Christ follower and, and gone away to college. She's at college now, falling with the wrong friends, dating a non-believer, doing all kinds of things she shouldn't be doing. And, and, she, and she's, her mom's challenging her on this. And she said, hey, mom, listen, you know I'm a Christian, and I know Jesus will eventually forgive me, and he'll eventually work it out for good, and then I'll have a testimony. I'm like, what part of this whole thing about cutting things off, right? I talked to another person that same week, concerned about her sister, claims to be a Christ follower, living with a man who's not a husband, um, and saying, well, God's really blessing me and using me in lots of ways. I think he's okay with him. 
what about cutting it off Fit, fits with that? You see, see, often we've created a Jesus in our own image. And Jesus said, hey, I'm not, I'm not kidding here. I'm not kidding here. Hey, if there's something that's pulling you away from me, you got to deal with it. Sometimes it's very clear what it's sin, and, and it's like we just need to deal with it. It can destroy us, stop us from following him altogether. Uh, other times uh, in our life, it, it's not something. Like, it's, just, it's something that's not, it's kind of a, it's not either a good or bad. It just is. But, but there's things that sometimes they're not necessarily good or bad, that they just become an idol in our life, right? They become bad. And, and so, for example, money's not a bad thing, but, but your money has to be submitted to Jesus. If it becomes your God, it becomes a bad thing, right? Uh, it, your sexuality, sexuality is a good thing, but if it becomes your God, it becomes a bad thing. Certain relationships are a good thing, but they're a gift from God, but if they become your top thing, they become a bad thing. Jesus said there in your notes, in, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, no one can serve two masters. You can't do it. Like in our lives as Christ followers, there's only room for one king. You can't have two kings. And he said, so either you'll hate the one, love the other, or, love, or be devoted to the one, despise the other. And then he, his illustration is you can't serve God in what? Money. So what Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, sooner or later you have to surrender this area of money. How you make it, how you spend it, how you give it, how you save it. And yet I know all kinds of people who can call themselves Christ followers. Some of you are here, 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 you're, you're here now. I don't know who you are. I just know you're here. <laughs> but there's some of you here, you, you claim to be a Christ follower, and yet if I were to open your checkbook, there's no evidence at all. But based on what Jesus is measuring, there's no evidence at, at all. But it's not just money. It could be all kinds of things, right? It could be anything else in life can become that idol. It can become that God. It becomes our top value. Jesus said, you can't do it. If you're going to follow me, you have to deal. You know, sometimes in our life, um, there are, it's, it's not so much an, ad, an issue of sin. Uh, it's just something that in our life that the Holy Spirit comes along and says, because I love you and because I want the most for you, uh, there's a spiritual discipline or there's, a, there's something that needs to be cut off. There's something that, a next step, and it's, it's not necessarily, it's not wrong thing at all. It's, uh, I think like in my own life, I've given this example a couple times over the years, but so many of us are new. Just let me throw it out again and bear with me if you've heard it before. But like in my own life, there was a time many years ago where uh, I felt like God came and talked to me about sports. Like I've always been a big sports fan. I love sports, you know, grew up loving sports, you know, all the teams, all the players, all the stats. Uh, my emotions would go up when my team would win, go down when they, they lost. And in our early marriage years when we had young kids, I just felt at a certain point that the Holy Spirit came really out of the blue out of the blue, and this is the way he comes, and he just put it in my heart, and this is the best way to put it, so when the Holy Spirit's leading you, he puts a desire in your heart for something. Now, there's going to be something that has to be cut off, and that may be painful, but he, doesn't just, he, he puts a desire in your heart. It's how he leads us, and he put a desire in my heart to, to put aside sports and not do sports anymore. That's a pretty big deal, right? It wasn't that hard because he was kind of leading in that way, but, but, but what had happened, it just become too big in my life. When the Chargers would lose, our family was gloomy, right? I mean, for hours, there was, a, there was a pall over our family. Stay away from dad. The Chargers lost, right? And some of you, some of you are like, going, that is stupid. I, I agree. I agree. But a lot of you are going, yeah, way to go, man. That's the way I am too. So, uh, and so I, I seriously, I've gone walks, calm myself down, right? And so there just came a point where I think Jesus was just saying, Mike, you know, there's nothing wrong with sports, but the, this has got too, too much. We just, I've got some other things for you. So can I tell you, for 10 years, I went on a fast for, from sports. 10 years. Now I'm back. I, I nibble a little bit now. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> For, for 10 years, just kind of put that aside because there were certain things. That you, remember that series we did a couple years ago called The Simple Life? And, and we, one of the principles we learned is the good is the enemy of the best. And there's so many areas where the Holy Spirit's going to come in. It might not be a bad thing. Says, I want to take you to the next level. I want to deepen your relationship. I want to help you to grow. And so he's going to come to you. I had one friend that the Holy Spirit came to him and said, it's time to give up golf. Okay, he was a... He was a new father, and the Holy Spirit just showed him that, that, hey, if you play golf, you're going to be out every Saturday morning for a ton of hours when you have limited time to be with your son. And so during these years, no golf, right? We're going to give up something good, 
jack off for something great, being a father. Okay? Uh, I, I have a, a friend that was, uh, he's, he's a gifted author, and when his kids were young, he wrote his first book or two, and it went really well, but God just came to him and just showed him, it's like, hey, this is taking all your extra time, you can't be a good father. So to give that, when the time will come, and now his kids are old now, and he's writing a ton of books. Hey, but it was, it was a season. I, I've known people where, uh, I was talking with a couple last night, where, where uh, the very gifted woman, uh, who uh, was a very gifted professional woman making a lot of money, and, and God came to them and just felt like he wanted her to step down from that and become a one-income family because they could focus more on ministry, right? Uh, I've known people that uh, video games, which are great, but video games become consuming. It's like every night, hours online playing video games, tired the next day, uh, work ethic goes down, relationships go down, Right? And, and they become, and so the good has become an enemy of the best, you see? Now, here's what I want you to catch. Only those people who really want to hear from the Holy Spirit hear these kinds of shepherdings. People that are not listening to God in the clear black and whites are never going to hear God in the nuance. You tell me, I'm like, I, I want a relationship with God. I want it's powerful. I, I want it's deep. I want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Okay, great. Then start obeying what you know. And as you obey what you know, he will begin to speak more. See, see if, if, we're, if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit when he's screaming at us, hey, you're, you're living with your boyfriend, you're a follower of Jesus, knock it off. If, if we're not willing to listen to the Holy Spirit when he's screaming, we're never going to hear him when he's whispering. And here's the thing, as followers of Jesus, throughout our life, there will come times where Jesus will say, hey, it's time to do some pruning. It's time to do an amputation, not because I, I don't love you, because I do, and I want you to get all of life. I've got a plan for your life, and it's amazing. There's times you're going to have to give up the good for the great. And he says, and trust me, you're going to be thanking me forever. Because when you make these choices, you never look bad or, or sad. You always look back and wonder, why did it take me so long? You see? Because we go from here to here. Our life takes off in new ways. So the question I have for you today, whether it's big or small, is there any surgery the Holy Spirit is requiring of your life? Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for your word and that you just tell us the truth. Um, you don't uh, mince words. You don't uh, beat around the bush. You tell us, hey, the next life is real. It is both amazing and terrifying. Choose well. And so, Jesus, we pray you'd help us. We pray you'd shepherd us. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to make the right decisions. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to talk to those of you who are not yet Christ's followers. And Jesus is calling. You know he's calling. You want to run to him. But there's something in your life holding you back. I want to ask you today, are you ready to follow? Are you ready to repent and turn and then to believe and to trust him? And so today, while our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. If this expresses the desire of your heart, I encourage you to pray along with me in your mind. God will hear you as you give your life to Jesus. So, so let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I bow the knee to you. I surrender to your leadership. I turn from my past. I ask you to forgive me for all my rebellion. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to lead me in the path to life and shepherd me and mentor me and teach me how to live life the way it's meant to be lived. I ask you to reserve a spot for me in the next life that I live with you forever. Where our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you just prayed that prayer and you're sincere, I just want to welcome you to the kingdom. And inside your program is a little card called the Connect Card. 
And what I'd ask you to do is simply to fill that out. In a few minutes, we'll be taking our offering as we worship. And, and just drop that in, the, drop that in the, the, the bag as it goes by. But write me a note on the back. It says, Mike, I prayed the prayer. Or, Mike, I asked Jesus into my life. Or, I gave my life to Jesus. Whatever you want to say, I'll, I'll know what you mean. Then this week, I'll be able to reach out, send you a letter, and talk with you just a little bit about the next steps in your walk, your new relationship with Christ. And so, Lord, we, we, we come now as your church, and as we, we worship you, God, we just we reflect that for us as Christ followers, it, it's always and only, ever only Jesus, that there is no higher value. Give me Jesus. I, I don't want the world. Give me Jesus. It's what we need. It's what we want. And we surrender to you today. And we pray that you'd fill us with a new passion for you. If there's anything in our life that needs to be removed, excised, cut off, amputated, uh, pruned away, that you would show us now as we worship and that we would trust in you and take that step and we would move into new life as a result. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.